Evening, this is Robert Sanjetas coming to you once again on the Open Question Program for November 27th, Wednesday, 2019. As you know, I endeavor to answer your questions, entertain your comments on subjects concerning the Bible, Catholicism, theology, philosophy, things of those nature of, of that nature and if you would like to participate and ask questions you can do so uh, just write your question on the board and i will get to it in due time uh, as you know tomorrow is thanksgiving and we celebrate this holiday as americans in thanksgiving to god for all the blessings the gifts the providence that he has given us in this past year and despite all the evil things that are going on in the world today where Satan is making it very uncomfortable despite all that our God reigns and gives us blessings every day some of which we are not even cognizant of and so tomorrow is that day that we set aside to give God the thanks it's not a day just for turkeys and cranberry sauce and mashed potatoes and gravy, but a day that we should set aside with some prayer, honest, sincere prayer to God, thanking him for all the things that he's given us this past year and the things that we don't even know about that he's done for us. So take advantage of that tomorrow. Tonight, we are here again to talk about our faith Hopefully, from it, we can all grow closer to God, and that's what I'm here for. So, uh, as I always do before I start the program, I just want to do some selfish self-promotion of our websites. Um, we have the website robertsongenis.com.org.net, uh, where you can purchase all the books, movies, CDs, DVDs, even cassette tapes still that we have available for all the topics that I've covered over the last 26 years now, going on 26 years. Catholic Apologetics International, now uh, run by Catholic Apologetics International Publishing, Inc. We are a 501c3 corporation, and so any donations you give, since we're coming close to the end of the year, you can still get your tax-deductible donation in to CAI Publishing, Inc., uh, P.O. Box 278, State Line, Cali uh, State Line, Pennsylvania, 17263. I used to live in California. That's why I get mixed up sometimes. At any rate, um, please uh, think about making a year-end donation, uh, all tax deductible to you. Uh, to, uh, uh, you can even donate on the robertsongenis.org website. Just click on the donation button, and uh, you, it will go a long way in helping us continue the work that we've done now for our next year being tw our 27th year. So God has blessed us tremendously uh, in that regard. Speaking of giving thanks to God, I have a lot to be thankful for, for this ministry, and that is why I'm able to come to you tonight. Okay, so let's get to our uh, questions for tonight. If we run out of questions, I will shut it down and uh, go enjoy my uh, pre-Thanksgiving holiday with my family. So so tonight here, Darren is here tonight, Jose, Victor, Adam, and Ben, of course, is top of the list with his question. Uh, Joshua is here, Will is here, uh, Darren, John, Alex is here. All right, so, okay, Ben says, greetings, Robert. Where is Noah's Ark precisely located now? Please, could a satellite take photos and pinpoint its exact location, which I believe is somewhere in the mountains of Ararat in Turkey? What is gopher wood exactly, of which Noah's Ark was made? Where is the Ark of the Covenant today? I have heard Egypt, Ethiopia, Jerusalem, and heaven as possible locations. From what kinds of wood were the crib of our Lord in the manger and the Holy Cross upon which our Lord was crucified made? 
why do you think it is that Protestants have done so much more the Catholics in trying to track down Old Testament relics like Noah's Ark and the Ark of the Covenant? <clears throat> Thank you. Please keep your wonderful work. Keep up your wonderful work. Okay, Ben, as usual, you got like 10 questions in one paragraph. <laughs> so... Oh, I'll try to answer what I can. Some of those I know I don't know the answer to already, so um, uh, I'll try to wing it. Um, some of them I do know the answer to. So at any rate, let me begin. So where is Noah's Ark precisely located now, please? Now, um, yeah, the, the last thing we have in Scripture, of course, Ben, as you, as you already pointed out, is uh, Mount Ararat. Okay. Um, in Turkey. So, you know, there's been about a dozen expeditions to Ararat by um, some Americans, some foreigners, and the problem with Ararat, for some reason, uh, the Turkish government has been quite stingy on allowing expeditions up to the place where they think that Noah's Ark could be. Okay. Now, um, as far as I know, nobody has ever uh, photographed a big boat on Mount Ararat. Okay. Uh, and we know what the dimensions of approximately, because it all depends on what a cubit is uh, in Genesis. Uh, some There's actually two different ways to measure a cubit, believe it or not, which make things more confusing. But we know approximately what the size of the boat would be. So, uh, but as far as I know, there's been no pictures taken of that size boat uh, sitting on Mount Ararat, okay? As a matter of fact, the guy that I was talking about last night, uh, and I did remember his name, his name is Ron Wyatt, Protestant guy, but uh, just, he's got, the, he's got the blood of expedition in him, and uh, he has made some tremendous travels, not only uh, in the Middle East and around uh, Turkey, but uh, other places as well, Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, the man is just, uh, you know, a fountain of evidence for various theories. Uh, you know, it's, there's one thing about collecting da data, and that is the data has to be interpreted uh, by a human being. So although we may have all the same data, sometimes we don't have the same data because sometimes we don't share it with each other. But uh, it all depends on what the interpretation of that data is that's going to determine you know, what we teach to people. And sometimes that interpretation can be wrong. I'm not saying that Mr. Wyatt is wrong. And speaking of Mr. Wyatt, uh, Ron Wyatt is his name. Uh, the theory that someone brought up yesterday, last night rather, is, uh, you know, about the blood of the cross dripping down and uh, going down below and hitting the burial site of Adam. Um, Ron Wyatt, if I saw one of his videos and he said he went to this place and he uh, and and there was a place to climb down it had a stairway in it already which doesn't surprise me because a lot of these places um you know people make pilgrimages and you know the, the commerce of the particular place that it's in is is boosted tremendously by the travel of people coming and, and, and trying to find these various sites that are talked about. Uh, so, the, you know, he was very welcomed when he went there and went down the stairway and he found blood on, um, now this word gets a little fuzzy because he claimed that the Ark of the Covenant was in this place buried beneath Calvary, okay, um, and that the people there promote that idea. Now, I don't remember from the video whether, and this is like 10 years ago I saw this video, so it's just coming back to me in bits and pieces, but I don't know whether he said he saw the ark there or that it was the original place that the ark was. Which then, of course, as you mentioned in your question, at least all kinds of theories about where the Ark is. 
And, you know, they get pretty wild too, you know, like Ethiopia being the place because the black Jews um, <clears throat> took, the, took the Ark of the Covenant to Ethiopia and the white Jews want to get it back to bring it back to Jerusalem, all that kind of stuff that, you know, I couldn't give you an ounce of opinion whether that's all malarkey or not. You know, I mean, it has to be somewhere if it still exists. That's the other thing. Does it still exist? And so everybody that has a theory about where it might be is, is assuming that it exists. All right. Well, that's kind of sketchy too. So, um, but anyway, Ron Wyatt has his theory that it was buried uh, beneath the cross and there was blood that he got from either the blood on the ark or, and of course they wouldn't allow him to take the ark out. Okay. That's, you know, a privilege now for these people that live in this area, but he took the blood out and had it examined and a expert in, um, a blood test uh, told him that it was living blood. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's possible. It's possible. But, um, you know, I, I just take all these stories with a grain of salt. And I, I honestly want to tell you that I don't know. And I would have no way of certifying this. All I can tell you is what they talk about as possibilities. And in this life, sometimes that's all we have to live with is possibilities. And in the end of the game, as I keep saying on this program, it's all un very unimportant because we live by faith, not by sight, as you well know. And, you know, be, it would be wonderful if we could verify these things like we verify uh, over 10,000 healings that have happened at Lourdes where, you know, St. Bernadette, you know, the Mary appeared to St. Bernadette, and we have this pool of water, and people are healed there, really healed. So we can actually see it happening, and, and that strengthens our faith, okay? So, uh, and we see the Eucharistic miracles all over the world, wherein, you know, the it's it may be originally uh, the consecrated host uh, that turns into actual flesh of Jesus. Okay. Those things are around and a lot of them in Italy, as a matter of fact, and, and you know, other places in Europe, but most of them are, are in Italy. That's all possible too. I mean, it's, you go to see him and you know, it, it, you see flesh there in, in a jar. And, uh, you know, if everybody's being honest about this, you know, there's no reason not to believe it is actually the flesh of Jesus that he would give us these miracles to strengthen our faith, especially in the modern times that we live. Um, what else? Um, um, yeah, the uh, incorruptible bodies, St. Bernadette being one of them. Okay. I mean, you look at her body, which is what, 150 years old, and it looks she looks better than I do. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thank God for, for, for miracles like that and in, in depth that are just waiting to see this incorruptible body that's been there for 150 years and looks the same as the day she died. I don't know why there's not a million people standing in line right now not going to see that, okay? Because if it's true, then everything that Catholicism has said is true. Because St. Bernadette lived by everything the church said. And so her miracles are just verifying all that she believed in. Um, so, but, you know, people some are just not moved by this for some reason. Okay. Um, but in the end, you know, we really don't need it. We really don't need lords. We don't need, you know, Eucharistic miracles. We thank God that we have them. But again, we live by faith. Okay. Not by sight. As a matter of fact, I think I mentioned once on this program, the more God shows you by sight, the more he's going to expect from you. Okay? Because, you know, you like an old saying, be careful what you ask for. Yeah. 
Okay, if you live by faith now and everything that you do is dependent on your faith, well, you know, God's going to have a certain criterion by which he judges you because it's all by faith. But if he shows you something and you see it with your own eyes, much more is going to be expected of you. You're going to be much more responsible for what you know and what you're required to do than if you were just living by faith without sight. Okay, so be careful when you get into these areas you know, about, you know, where's Noah's Ark and, you know, what's the blood mean and where's the Ark of the Covenant and all this stuff, okay? Um, It's a two-way street, double-edged sword, so to speak, uh, on finding such evidence uh, with your eyes, okay? Um, So anyway, going back to, uh, all right, here's a second question. What is gopher wood? Gosh, good. um, It's it's not a gopher, of course, you know, the animal of the gopher. It's not, <laughs> it has nothing to do with a gopher. Um, it's, that's just the way the Hebrew word is pronounced, gopher. Okay, so um, I did some analysis on that a while ago. I don't have it in front of me. Everything I do on this program is off the cuff, okay? Uh, so if I don't remember it on the spot, I'm just not going to say anything about it. But I do know that there's some derivative of the Hebrew word gopher, and uh, I just don't remember what that is right now, okay. Um, from what kinds of wood were the crib of the Lord? I have no idea. I don't even know if he had a wooden crib. I mean, where are you getting that from? Um, he, he was laid in a manger. I mean, that would mean that it was like a water trowel or an eating trowel for the animals, I would assume so. If, if that's where, you know, since that's where he was born. And basically, instead of putting water or food in there, they put hay. And, you know, Jesus was laid in there. What kind of wood it was, I'm, I would assume that would be the same kind of wood all those trowels were made of. Nothing special. Okay, now if you're hinting that it was gopher wood, um, you know, again, that would be an interesting fact. Okay. Um, I have never heard that before. Okay, so I'm only going to tell you from what my experience is. Um, and the same with the cross. Okay, so um, now I do know there was bits and pieces of the cross supposedly uh, splintered off of the original cross, and these were sold as relics. When I went to Rome, uh, what was it, gosh, almost 20 years ago now, um, <clears throat> someone claimed to have had the original um, uh, inscription of Inri, I-N-R-I, and it was on the wall of one of these churches in Rome, and I could read the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Latin, and could verify that, yeah, it was, you know, that's what was the uh, inscription put on that plaque, and, um, you know, but, uh, and it looked real old, you know, it could have been 2,000 years old. And so I could say, you know, based on what they were telling me, I was standing right next to the plaque that was written on Jesus' cross. <laughs> and I could read it. Uh, and that was an experience, I'll tell you that. If that's all true, I have no certainty whatsoever. Uh, all I can tell you is um, I, I saw what they claimed it to be, and I trusted them at that point. And whether that will change or not, I don't know. Okay. Um, as much as that moved me then, I think about it now, and, you know, it's just one of those artifacts that you happen to come across. It, um, it doesn't make me any stronger in my faith. Like, you know, I believe long before I ever saw that plaque, and that's because the Spirit of God came into me and allowed me to believe in Him, and I accepted it, and, and that's what I need. All right, so... Uh, Why do you think it is that Protestants have done so much more than Catholics in trying to track down Old Testament relics like Noah's Ark and the Ark of the Covenant? That's a good question. Um, You know, it never used to be that way. The Catholics were the ones who were were, um, dealing in relics. And uh, as a matter of fact, on my desk, I have uh, supposedly, what is it here? I have, I'll show it to you, okay, here is, uh, 
St. Robert Bellarmine, uh, a supposed bone of St. Robert Bellarmine, a chip of his bone. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. So, you see, as much as I talk about not needing this stuff, you know, I'm there with every other Catholic. It's nice to have a piece of St. Robert Bellarmine, who happens to be my favorite saint, by the way. Okay. Uh, right on my desk with me every day as I study the Word of God, as he did. Okay, and so there you have it. Uh, this one is, oh, uh, can't read it. Let me put my glasses on. Uh, St. Matthew. <laughs> there you go. I forget how much I paid for this. I don't know. Was it 50 bucks or something? I don't know. Uh, many years ago, St. Matthew's Bone right there, okay? Who else do I have here? Uh, I have, uh, let me see again. Oh, okay. So this one is a piece of cloth of St. Robert Bellarmine what he used to wear and it looks curiously the same as the bone does, but I'll trust whoever sent this to me. I'm sure he wouldn't be dishonest. Uh, and then <laughs> another one of my favorite saints, St. Paul. Okay, here you go. Bone fragment from St. Paul, I am told. Okay. So I have all four of these on my, Two from Robert Bellarmine, one from Matthew, and the, the Apostle Matthew, that is, okay? And um, St. Paul. On my desk with me every day, so they keep company for me. Um, now, back to your question. Um, yeah, the Catholics used to be into this in the Middle Ages. You know, relics were, you know, a whole business, basically. Um and then it died out a little. Um, but the conservative Catholics, the traditional Catholics, are the ones that still hold the tradition that these relics are important and um, the value, valuable for your Christian life. Uh, because they have, you know, um, what's that grace? Um, um, they're sacramentals, and they have a certain amount of actual grace just like when you dip your hand in the holy water. Okay, that's a sacramental too, and you get a certain amount of grace. So never fail to put your finger in the holy water and sign yourself with the cross, okay? Because you do good grace with that, all right? So, you know, that's what we believe in Catholicism, that um, a material object can hold God's grace, okay? Think about that. A material object can, can can hold God's grace and then be transmitted to you. Okay, wow, that's a there's a philosophical concept equal to how many angels fit on the head of a pin. All right, figure that one out. Uh, at any rate, um, when the liberal movement started in the Protestant churches in the mid 1700s. You know, it's, it was only a hundred years after, well, maybe 200 years after Luther, a hundred years after John Wesley, the famous Protestant preacher from England. Just within a hundred years, he had basically this anti Christian, liberal Protestant movement starting up. And after it got its steam, it just permeated all of Europe, okay, into the 1800s and 1900s. And uh, it just split whatever was there, a Protestantism that was similar to Catholicism was eaten up by this liberal movement. And then, okay, so um, then a lot of Catholics began at that time in the mid 1800s late 1800s 
there was a whole big liberal movement, modernistic movement in Catholicism. Okay, so what we're seeing today did not happen overnight, all right, as is usually the case with movements in history. It takes a long time to get the thought process going, and they work out all their kinks, and, and then it explodes someday down in the future, uh, as it did in the mid-20th century, okay? So uh, that's when uh, Catholics started to basically turn their nose up at relics. And, and of course, it wasn't just relics, uh, sacramentals. It was the whole notion that there was a devil, you know, uh, that Jesus performed miracles, that, you know, the feeding of the 5,000 was just everybody brought their lunch, and, and the apostles basically lied to us that it was a miracle to keep the movement going, okay? So, <laughs> you know, everything was torn apart. And uh, these are by men who are basically, you know, the upper echelon philosophers of Catholicism, they figure all these things out, and then slowly but surely, it slips down into the universities and the colleges and uh, the high schools and blah, 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 and, you know, and people just think, where did this come from? Well, they don't know how, how these movements progress. So, you know, it took about 150 years or so to get where we're at today, but it did not come out of a vacuum, I can, I can assure you that. But the, but with the Catholics, it was accelerated. It took the Protestants like 200 years to figure out that they didn't believe in the Jesus of the New Testament anymore. And that, you know, the miracles were a bunch of bunk and just propaganda uh, 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 promoted by the apostles and all that. And then it took the Catholics maybe 50 years because the Protestants had done all the work, <laughs> okay, all, all their so-called work that they think that they'd arrive now at this conclusion. And so the Catholics didn't have that much to do. So once they were given the go ahead to go study Protestant liberal theology by Pius XII in, in 1943, well, it didn't take much longer. It took just maybe 20 years for them to get right where the Protestants were. That took them 200 years to get to. Okay, and among those was this whole, whole thing about, you know, don't worry about the relics. Don't worry about the sacramentals. It's all make-believe. Okay, that's what they were telling us. You know, this is why liberalism is so devastating. Okay? Uh, and this is what everybody's talking about, that what's come into the church today that makes it, you know, it's like on the edge of apostasy. Okay? It's all these liberal modernistic movements that have been swirling around for 100 or 200 years. And, um, you know, so that's, that's why the Catholics really lost interest in relics and things of that nature, because they were just emptied of their value by all the liberals in, in the Catholic Church. And there's many more liberals in the Catholic Church than there are conservatives. I would estimate that, I would estimate that, you know, except for countries like South Korea or Nigeria, uh, there's probably... 80% of the Catholic Church is liberal today, including the, the hierarchy, okay? So that's where we're at, folks, and it could be worse than that. I'm just giving a sort of a wild estimate here. So you, you want to know why we don't value relics like we used to, or even holy water, or talk about the devil as a real being. It's because of this movement, okay? Um, and But now Protestants, even though there was a, liberal movement in Protestantism, what happened with them was this movement started to empty their churches. Okay, they found by the turn to the 20th century that their churches were being emptied. And, you know, and, and with the emptying of the churches, what does that spell? That spells no money. Okay, and we all need money to survive, don't we? All right, yeah, so... Uh, there, then there was a turn against the liberal movement in Protestantism, and you had a, a, another push for conservative theology, and along with that, you had a push with Pentecostal uh, theology, 
miracles, speaking in tongues, just the total opposite of what the liberals were saying just a, you know, a few years prior, because that wasn't a good moneymaker. Okay? You can have all the good, all the you know, theology that you think is right available, but if you can't survive with it, then it's going to go by the wayside whether you like it or not. Okay? You have to have something to draw the people in. Okay, so you had uh, at the turn of the 20th century, you had the Pentecostal movement, the Assemblies of God movement, uh, all created to make Christianity attractive again. Okay, uh, you had the uh, circuit riders on horses going from town to town in the late 1800s. Uh, they called the uh, first, second, third Great Awakening. Um, and these, these, a lot of these had an economic impetus to them. Okay. Uh, because the churches were dying. And so, uh, you had something to make it attractive and lo and behold, Protestant churches, you know, turned away from their liberalism and survived. Uh, and the mainline denominations began to die off one by one. Okay. And, some of them still survive today, but just barely, just barely. They can barely keep enough people opening up the doors and sitting in the pews, okay? Same thing is happening to Catholicism, okay? You get a lot of this liberal theology, and people just figure out, look, I can't find God with liberal theology, okay? I need a religion that thinks the devil's real, and he's after me. And the only way of escape is to turn to God in prayer, and do my faith, okay? Enough of this idea that Satan doesn't exist, and I can't get help by dipping my hand in the holy water to give me grace, okay? I want a religion with substance, something I can live with and live by, okay? So there's always a revolt against liberal theology, but that was the theology basically to try to do away with relics and things like this, okay? And they can just get away with it for so long. And then the people just are fed up with it, okay? And that's what's happening in Catholicism right now. And, you know, all this liberal movement that we've had from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and, uh, you know, 70s, 80s, whatever, I, I, this is my prediction. We're just going, either Jesus is going to come back because he's fed up with it, or the people are going to get fed up with it and throw these guys out one by one. And we're going to have a whole new revival in Catholicism, okay? Because it's not you; it's just not going to survive the way it is now, okay? With all these liberal movements just basically emptying the pews. So for how many Catholic churches have just closed their doors, and now it's a bowling alley? You know, I mean, it's just amazing across the country, just in America, okay? Um, we can't, we don't produce enough priests for our parishes. That's why some priests are working in four parishes at one time. Okay. We have one right in our, my town here, a, a priest who has to keep going back and forth between two parishes. Some I know a little further away that have to go between four parishes because there's not enough priests to go around. Well, this was the cause of the liberal movement. Okay. Where it wasn't. You know, you, you weren't blessed by God if you became a priest uh, or a nun. Uh, they looked at it like, you know, big deal. You know, you're, you're, you're living a fantasy life if you, if you be a priest or a nun. You know, thinking somehow that you're going to get a greater reward in heaven, you know, from God. This is, these are all liberal ideas that destroyed the church, okay? Because these guys didn't believe in God in the first place. If they did believe in God, it was just some kind of, you know, deistic idea that he was out there somewhere and just really wasn't concerned about us. Okay? A lot of Freemasonic ideas got in the church, wherein the concept of God was there, but he wasn't personal with man. He left him on his own, so to speak. That's, what the, kind of, that's the kind of God these people believed in. But Catholicism doesn't teach that kind of a God. It teaches a personal God who is watching you every second of the day and expects the best from you every second of the day and will reward you in kind, you know, later in the, in the next life. But right now is your trial. 
And, you know, this is, this is really, this is raw religion. Okay. Where you and your God are one-on-one and, and, and everything is dependent on what you do. Okay. Well, they didn't like that kind of religion because they didn't like the guilt that came along with it. They didn't like the responsibility. They didn't like the war that they had to go fight against this evil world out there. They were tired of all that. Okay. They wanted a religion that was comfortable, that was coalescing with the world, not fighting the world. And, you know, that way everybody could be happy and everybody could be comfortable if we lived in our own faith and, you know, uh, worship God the, all the way we wanted to worship God, not the way the church told us to worship God. And the, the church told us to worship God that way because the church knows God and knows what God wants. And basically the church said, if you want to know God and worship God, here's the way to do it. Here's, here's what we were taught by our ancestors, by scripture, and common sense. Okay? Here's the way it is. And they didn't want that anymore. The liberals didn't. They wanted freedom. Freedom. And that's what liberalism is all about. It's freedom to break the rules, basically. It's what it is. Those rules were, you know, for that generation. And that generation, you know, they, they didn't know as much as we know. See, we're sophisticated. And, you know, so, and you know where that gets them. Anyway, so long answer to your question there about relics. But as you can see, some of these things just open up a can of worms because there's a lot beneath the surface than just relics. Okay. And, of course, that's true with most things in life. There's a lot beneath the surface that, you know, you know you can either scratch the surface and get your answer, or you can dig deep and get your answer and find out where all the stuff is coming from, okay? And eventually, everything leads back to the Garden of Eden, you know, if you want to dig real deep, <laughs> okay? So, that's what we have. All right, let me move on here. Uh, Will says, in Matthew 12, 21, 12, Jesus cleanses the temple from the vendors. I have not consulted Mark, Luke, or John's account well, the cleansing of the temple. Do the Gospels teach us that it is wrong to sell things inside the temple and or in the temple area? Has sacred tradition of the magisterium ever taught that it is wrong to sell inside the church or the church area? Um, well, Will, I think this, answer, this uh, question is self-explanatory. Um, you know, if it, it's if it's wrong for the money changers to do their business in the temple, because what did Jesus say? He said, you know, my house shall be a house of prayer. Okay. So, I mean, there's no reason to do business inside the temple um, when you can do it outside the temple. Okay. The temple is sacred ground. And, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just a little puzzled at your question because it just seems to me to be common sense from what the passages tell us. Because Luke and Mark and John's account are basically the same thing. Okay, each of those Gospels have that story. Um there's, a, there's only a little discrepancy between John and the Synoptic Gospels on how, what's the chronology of Jesus saying certain things. But other than that, they're basically all the same. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't, yeah, I'm just puzzled at why you would uh, think that that would be a concern. Because obviously, you know, Jesus is teaching not to do business in the temple. The temple is sacred ground. Uh, it is only a place of prayer and worship. That's it. Nothing else goes on there. Okay. Um, what it does tell us about that society is how degraded it became when no one gives a second thought to doing business uh, in the temple. You know, I mean, it's just how far... Does a society have to go down to the depths to not know the distinction between doing business in or outside the temple 
when the temple becomes a place of business, it means they have not the slightest clue who God is and what he wants. Okay? So basically, that's what those stories are telling us. How bad it was when Jesus came. Okay? So, you know, these are people that their whole history is just one big giant sin. You know, separated by maybe a few years of a good king here, a good king there, a good prophet here. And that's about it. Okay? So, I mean, what would we expect from them at the tail end of their existence, basically? Not much. All right? So, that's what it's telling us. That they hadn't really improved at all when you compare them to the, the uh, Israelites prior to them. They just really had not advanced at all for 2,000 years, okay? And until finally God himself, the epitome of long-suffering and patience, couldn't put up with them anymore and cut them off, okay, and built his church, okay? So, you know, that's the story behind the temple is, you know, where did this all come from? Did this just happen overnight? These people just suddenly said, oh, well, let's, you know, the temple's nice and cool. Let's go in there and do our business. Is that where it all originated? Uh, no. Okay, there's a whole history behind this. What, what would motivate them to even think about the temple and doing business in the temple? It was their whole history. Okay? They learned it from their fathers. Their fathers learned it from their fathers before them and their fathers before them, and so on and so on. And it's just passed down. Okay? So, uh, Jose says, Did the devil eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I read that scripture, hints of a possibility of this. Um, no, uh, Jose, I have never seen that in scripture. Uh, I have never heard of a father or a medieval um, talk about that. So if you know, where you think that is in scripture, please let me know. I'd like to go examine the scripture. I'll make a bet with you, however, that it ain't in there. Okay? So, um, I'll make you, well, thanks. Uh, let, me, let me not go there. All right. Um, okay, Darren says, can you suggest any good resources on the filioque way from a Roman Catholic perspective? The Orthodox have a very different approach to the church history prior to the so-called split. Happy and blessed Thanksgiving. Uh, Darren, go to the Internet. You will find a ton of stuff on the Filioque. Just put Filioque in your, in your search engine, and you will come up with pages and pages and pages of good material. Okay? I mean, even Wikipedia. I looked at that the other day on the Filioque. You have an excellent, excellent source of information on Wikipedia. And that's because good Catholics go in there and write on Wikipedia. Okay? And you get a lot of different sources. A lot of different Catholics go in there and write on Wikipedia. So I was amazed at what I found on Wikipedia about the Filioque. They have a Greek language in there, and they've got uh, footnotes galore. Every statement has to be verified and, and sourced. So then you have all that material and all that footnoted material has links, hyperlinks, and you can go check out those sources. And also that's where I would direct you. All right. Um, yeah. And it's quite a complicated subject. Quite a complicated subject. All right. Um, Adam says, why are flat earthers mistaken? taken when they think their long horizon views with cameras econ p900 prove that the earth could not be curved thank you kindly uh well adam uh hate to do this to you but that's a science question all right so all the science questions are reserved to the thursday show on um the principal facebook page okay so um 
uh, I'll have to refer you to that show. Now, unfortunately, since tomorrow is Thanksgiving, we won't have a program, but we will have one the week after. Okay, so that'll be Thursday, 7 to 8 p.m. Ask your question there, and I will be glad to answer it, and I know exactly what you're talking about here, uh, especially that Nikon P900. They have all the flat earthers, you know, think that's the their, uh, their camera, um, but it actually shows a lot more errors than they think. Uh, but let's, let's talk about it then, okay? Uh, Victor says, how could Catholics and Orthodox disagree in so many doctrines like baptism, purgatory, papacy, trinity, if they were once a single body? The rejection of the papacy by them is the most striking to me because it's a very simple and very important doctrine. How could the bishops of the East not know about it back then? Well, Victor, if I had the answer to that question, I'd be a very rich man. Okay? <laughs> to be very honest with you. All right? You know, I mean, you're asking a question that all the sages and wise men of the world have not been able to answer. What makes one man go one way and another man go another way with the same data, with the same evidence? Okay? So... I can't answer that for you, okay? I can't, I mean, they come up with arguments, but, you know, we've thought about those arguments too, you know, on the Western side of Christianity, and we've dealt with those. We said those arguments weren't good enough to reject the papacy, uh, whereas those on the East thought, well, yeah, it was good enough. Why do they think differently? I don't know, you know? I could give you guesses, but who who knows? In the final end of the story, what makes a man make a decision? Okay? Let me look at us men here. What makes one of us decide for God and another just stick his nose up toward God? And they got they live the same life. You know, they go to work eight hours a day, they eat, they sleep, they put on their pants one leg at a time, they take a shower. Uh, they do exercise, they read books, you know, uh, they have the same temptations of sin in front of them, you know. So what makes one man decide to go this way and another man that way? Yeah, like I said, if you had the answer to that question, you would answer all of psychology, all of philosophy, all of theology, and people would be knocking down your door. Because they finally found the answer of what makes man tick. What makes man decide one way or the other. Okay? So, <laughs> not a question that, um, no. I mean, you can get into all the intricacies of purgatory and the papacy and Mary and all that stuff with these people. But, you know, this is what we would expect to happen. It's not out of the realm of possibility that especially as complicated as the filioque is you're talking about the trinity okay nobody understands the trinity i'm telling you that right now okay we do know what you can't say about the trinity but nobody knows how three can be in one and one in three nobody knows that all we know is what the formula is okay and then when you're when you start talking about whether the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son or just the Father, you're getting to some real esoteric theology there. Okay? And there are arguments for both sides of the equation. I will admit that to the Eastern people. Okay? I think that the evidence leans toward the view that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, okay? But I can see why, because there's some scriptures that suggest what the Eastern Orthodox think it is, okay? And this just gets into the complexity of scripture itself and the context surrounding these various statements about the Holy Spirit. I just worked on a passage today in the Apocalypse. I spent all day on this one passage in um, Apocalypse chapter 1, verse 4, okay? And the state, the, um, 
the, the sentence is, he that was, he that is, and he that is coming. It was one of the most complicated passages I've ever studied in the Bible. And I'm still not sure which end I'm coming out on. And that has to do with the grammar that John used and what he's trying to say about these three entities, whether they're all one or they're talking about three entities there. Okay. He that is, he that was, he that is coming. All right. And it's used twice in the same chapter. It's used again in verse eight. Okay. So <laughs> these, these things are not easy. They're not easy. And I am glad that I, as a Catholic, don't have to reinvent the wheel every time I sit down to study Scripture. That men, long ago, holier and more intelligent and more dedicated than I will ever be, sat down and pounded these things out, dozens and dozens of them, and had councils that they met in, and they had monks that copied scripture for them and they poured over these things day and night and came out with some solutions for us and led by the holy spirit i mean these things were hard okay they were hard it took them four centuries to figure out what you could not say about, not what the Trinity was, but what you couldn't say about the Trinity. Because as I said, it's hard to, to even contemplate how three can be in one and one in three. I know a professor who went crazy. Yet when I was in seminary, one day, I mean, this guy was a genius. He had two PhDs. I think he was working on a third one. And in mathematics and what else, what, some other esoteric subject. <laughs> and one day, he sta he's standing up lecturing the class. And one day, out of the blue, he, he, he starts rocking back and forth as, as he's standing up. He's rocking back and forth. He's going three and one, one and three, three and one, one and three. <laughs> okay. The poor guy went crazy. He had a nervous breakdown. Okay? So these are the kind of subjects we're talking about here. And the same thing with the Incarnation. You know, it took them four centuries to figure out what you couldn't say. Not exactly what it was that made up the God-man. You know, because you're talking about, let's I'll give you an analogy. You have a glass that holds water. You pour water into the glass, fills it up to the brim. Okay? Let's say that represents the humanity of Jesus. And now you have another portion of water, and you're going to pour it in to the one that has the, the water already filled up to the brim. And somehow, um, the two are mixed, but it doesn't spill over. It doesn't spill over the brim. That's an analogy of the incarnation. Okay? Try to figure that one out. So he's 100% God and 100% man in one person. Good luck. Okay? So there were guys that thought that they had an idea of what, what all this was, and they would spell it out, and then the church would examine it and said, no, nope, can't say that. You know, and somebody else come along and have an idea how to explain it with an analogy. Nope, can't say that. And this went on for 400 years. Okay, so they finally thought they ironed it out well enough. Council of Ephesus, the Council of Chalcedon, uh, and, and told us what we couldn't say about these two things. But these are the two things that undergird all of Christianity. Okay? You have to know what the Trinity is, and you have to know what the Incarnation is to understand what redemption is all about. Okay? 
So we're dealing with tough subjects here. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that you'd get a whole group of people, especially in a political situation, as many of the Orthodox are, with Russia so far away from Italy, Rome. The further away you were from Rome, the more difficult it was for you because of the lack of communication. And these things were done in 1054. When, you know, we didn't have phones, we didn't have internet, okay? No telegraph. All we had were horses, okay? And they would travel back and forth, and it would take months, sometimes years, to travel back and forth. So the further away you were, the more problem you had, because you didn't get the message of what Rome decided as quick as somebody who was close to it, okay? So, you know, difficulties all the way around, all right? So there you go. Uh, Quack says, uh, do you think it would be more e efficacious to do an hour of mental prayer over going to a weekday Novus Ordo when we're not strictly required to go to Mass? Uh, Quack, you have to figure that out for yourself, son. Um, if you find that you're being led to prayer uh, as opposed to going to daily Mass, I think is what you're saying, you know, that's what you choose. All right? I'm sure God's going to bless you either way. All right? But I can't make that decision for you. Now, I would say that if you're deciding whether to go to Sunday worship as opposed to praying, well, that's not something for you to decide. That's already been decided for you. You know, you go to Sunday worship, okay? If you want to come home and pray, that's fine, all right? But we're required to worship God on Sunday, every Sunday, unless we're sick or some have some excuse, okay? So there you have it. Rose says, hi, Robert. Why do the disciples in Matthew 18 want to argue over who is the greatest in the kingdom of the heavens? I thought Peter was already given the keys to the kingdom and established at the new al Habayit. Good for you, Ro. Not many people use that word. <laughs> Actually, it's el Habayith, just to correct you. So it should be the I-I-T-H at the end. Uh, uh, if I have time, I'll explain what the El Habayith is to the rest of the people here. Uh, wouldn't he be a likely candidate for being the greatest? Weren't the disciples aware of this? Well, because the issue here, um, uh, Ro, is not about whether one of the apostles has a supremacy in authority. The issue as as um, the context tells us, is one of one-upmanship, okay? Jesus knew that the disciples were acting like the world. In the world, you have a lot of one-upmanship, okay? I am greater than you because I have a greater job, therefore... You owe me more respect. Uh, I am privileged over you, so I get first servings. You get second. Um, I am going to know all the best people in the city. You are, you know, subordinate to me, so uh, you get the crumbs from the table, so to speak. All that kind of stuff. That's the way the Gentiles live, Jesus said. Not so among you apostles. If you want to be great, he says, then you be the servant of everybody. How do you like that? Yeah. You want to be great? Well, go wash all the disciples' feet. Yeah, have them stick that big, dirty foot in front of you. And, you know, with all their weird toenails and crusty feet. Yeah, you wash all those. You're lucky if you make it to the sixth man. Okay. Can you imagine doing all 12 of those guys? That'll make you humble. Yeah. 
If that doesn't make you humble, I don't know what's going to make you humble. Okay. But Jesus says, that's how you're going to be great. The humbler you, the humbler you are, the greater you are in God's eyes. And then, once that happens, then God will say, Ah, oh, my servant, my humble servant, come and sit at the head of the table. Because you showed me how great you really were. By showing me how less you were. The kingdom of God is just the total paradox to the world. Absolute paradox. They just can't get it. Okay? They live in this dog-eat-dog -dog world, and the only way they see to be able to make it to the top is by beating everybody else down. All right? And that may be the way it works in this world, unfortunately. Yeah. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Look at yourselves, brethren. Not many of you are kings or princes or well-to-do. or Yeah, God called you from the humble stock to come into his house. You know, because God uh, turns the wisdom of the wise into foolishness. That's what the gospel does. Okay? Get the wisest man you think of in the world. You know, Mahatma Gandhi or Confucius or, or you know, whoever it is. Donald Trump. You know, measure them, <laughs> measure them up against God's, the foolishness of the gospel. And see where they really lie. Okay. Because to God, man is nothing, nothing. Okay. He's a mere thought. He's nothing. The only way you become something is if God makes you something. And God turns away from the proud, He resists the proud. Because they think they're something and that God owes them something because they're something. That's what the Jews' problem was. Okay? They thought God owed them something because they were special. And they were special because Abraham circumcised them. And they were different from the Gentiles who weren't circumcised. Okay? So this whole mentality uh, in, in uh, this passage Matthew 18 that's why Jesus says in the same chapter he's talking about children he says suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven and the and the disciples were trying to shoo the children away <laughs> you know Jesus says don't do that let them come to me for such as these deserve the kingdom of heaven like this humble child and unless you become like that child you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Ooh. Okay? That's right in the same chapter. Okay? So, wow. Total paradox. That's why it takes a lot to be a Christian. Day in and day out, you have to live like this. Where the rest of the world's all beating down the doors of everybody else, trying to make it to the top. Make more money. You know, how do we measure people today? Yeah, look on the internet. Uh, whatever server you use, you know, they usually have these little slides they put up every day. How much money does so and so make? And you know, who? What's your net worth? And who's in the Forbes five hundred or four hundred or whatever? And you know, all that kind of stuff. That's the way the world thinks. Okay, not so with the kingdom of God. That's why so few are going to be in the kingdom of God. All right. So that's what Jesus was fighting against, this whole one-upmanship one mentality of the apostles. And, you know, I can see Jesus getting frustrated over this. He's been with these guys, you know, a couple of years now, and they're not cluing in. They're not cluing in as to what he's all about and what he's trying to teach them. All right, so they had to learn some hard lessons. And this was one of them, okay? And, you know, where were they getting this from? John and uh, James, where were they getting this idea from? That, you know, they had to get their special place with Jesus on the right and left-hand side, baby. And everybody else, 
you know, find your own place. We're going to reserve our place. Where are they getting that from? Their mother. Yeah. Because that's the one that came to Jesus. Says, you know, hey, you know, uh, my boys here, they're helping you out a lot. How about reserving a place for them next to uh, your father? One on the right, one on the left. Ooh, yeah, now we see where it's all coming from. Yeah, mommy's mommy's behind all this. All right? So, yeah, this doesn't come out of a vacuum. She's in the world, too. She sees she's how it's run. And, you know, and, then, and if her sons get reserved places in heaven, hey, that means mom can skirt right through. Who's going to mess with mo the mom of, 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 of James and John? Okay, so she's making a pathway for herself. <laughs> See, Jesus can sniff all this out in a heartbeat. He knows the heart of man, and he knows where all these, these ideas are coming from. He sniffs them out, and he just puts them right in their place. He does it gently, okay, and that's one thing about this passage. He does it very gently, but puts them in their place, okay? And afterward, nobody said another word after he was done. And how many times do we read that in the gospel? And after he spoke, no man uttered another word. <laughs> it's just amazing. All right. Um, it's past 8 o'clock. I'm going to have to go. So happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Uh, Donald, Eric, Viken, Lawrence, uh, no, I haven't answered the question of the mass yet, Lawrence. And um, I was thinking about that today. Um, and I really didn't think it was important enough to do research on it. So I'm sorry. Uh, at any rate, um, it's nice to be with you again, guys. And I hope that you have had a wonderful time. I certainly have. And uh, I look forward to our next meeting, which will be, well, will be in December. December, oh no, that's wrong. No, oh, no, that's right. December the 3rd, Tuesday. We'll meet again in September 4th, the day after. All right, 7 to 8, December the 3rd. Look forward to meet, meeting you then again with your questions. And until then, I'd like to wish you a hearty, healthy Thanksgiving. And remember, when you wake up tomorrow morning, set aside five minutes. Thank God for all the things he's given you this year. And ask him for even more the coming year. I guarantee he will listen to you and answer your prayer. All right. We'll see you again next time. Take care. God bless.